Al Floss presents the complete and alarming history of America's greatest garage band, The Stools. Debut albums are one thing. The sophomore slump, that's another. But the third album is really the make or break thing for bands. You know, bands that, that can put together a great third album seem to stand the test of time. You can't overestimate the importance of the third album. Nirvana's In Utero was one of their biggest albums. U2's War, Hendrix Electric Ladyland were both third albums. The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night, Green Day's Dookie, London Calling by The Clash, all third albums. Well, you want to talk about the importance of third albums. Let me tell you about Graham Parker's third album, Stick To Me. It uh, had 80-piece orchestra strings, and he was getting ready to go out on tour with Thin Lizzy. And then, wouldn't you know, something happened, the album got wiped. So he had to rush back into the studio with Nick Lowe and cut the album in a week. No orchestra, maybe some horns. Uh, but then when we all heard the album, Mm, it was pretty much over. Career gone, momentum, bye-bye. And all he did was tour with Thin Lizzy. You know, in 1958, rock and roll got off to a bad start. Elvis was about to go into the Army, and Jerry Lee Lewis's marriage to his 13-year-old cousin was about to be made public. That was a trip. Now, the stools had to drop out of Alan Freed's big Broadway show because they had just scored a big gig in a mob-controlled nightclub in Cuba. But a week after New Year's, they're forced to leave the island as Castro's revolution hits the streets. Antonio Moretti's first wife, Dusty, stayed behind in Havana with a bullfighter she had fallen for, thinking this silly revolution would blow over in a couple days. She was never heard from again. The stools had played Jerry Lee Lewis's wedding reception six months earlier. They should have known something was up when there was a magician and a bouncy house. The stools released a song for Christmas of 57 that was a tribute to Jerry Lee getting married. It was called, She's Only Wearing Black Until They Make Something Darker. They didn't call Jerry Lee the killer for nothing. In the history of bad things, Like the Black Plague and Pearl Harbor The fall of Rome or Beijing Her life is even darker She's only wearing black until they make something darker She's only wearing black until they make something darker Everything she touches turns to bite her Everything you do reminds her of him Every song you say to write her That's what happens when your heart becomes a fan of lamb She said she's only wearing black Until they make something darker She said she's only wearing black Until they make something darker Get so tough in 13 years How can love get so dead and buried Now it's run out just like her tears How could Jerry Lee go get married She said she's on the wearing black Until they make something darker she said she's only wearing black until they make something darker. She said she's only wearing black until they make something darker. She said she's only wearing black until they make something darker. She said she's only wearing black until they make something darker. 
Bitch is only wearing black until they make something Bitch is only wearing black until they make something Bitch is only wearing black until they make something Bitch is only wearing black until they make something Bitch is only wearing black until they make something Bitch is only wearing black until they make something the Stools were pretty wise to keep the arrangements of their songs very simple. You know, there was guitar, bass, drums every once in a while, maybe a little bit of piano. The reason being, that's all that Al Floss would really pay for. Although, in the end, he did allow a little extra money for some background singers once in a while. I think Al Floss fell in love with the idea of background singers uh, after seeing Ray Charles and the Ray Letts. Floss wanted chick singers, and at first, Elvin only brought in guys. There were some great singers that came through Ray Charles' band. Darlene McRae, Patti Lyle, Margie Hendrix. You know, Mary Clayton, the, the great screamer on the Stones' Gimme Shelter, started out with the Raylettes' uh, Minnie Riverton, um, um, Alex Brown, who had a minor hit with Come On, Shout. Of course, there were a lot of unknowns that sang for him as well. And I mean, let's face it, Ray, Ray Charles could be a dick. There's one story about how uh, one of the Raylettes flubbed the line in the middle of one of the Ray Charles shows, and Ray stopped the show and just made this poor girl sing that one line over and over and over again until she got it right. Totally humiliated her right in the middle of it. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was said that that was kind of payback for not sleeping with Ray the night before. You know, just think of the name, Raylettes. You know, like, let Ray do what he wants. While Elvin and Antonio are down in Cuba and then back up to Boston, Cosmo Dittmer is also touring with a version of the stools opening up for Little Richard in the Philippines. But there's a huge problem on that tour. At the end of January, Little Richard entered Oakville College, which is located in Huntsville, Alabama. It's a school for black kids run by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, Little Richard explains, while flying over the Philippines on tour, the wing on his plane caught fire, and his prayers were answered when the plane made an emergency landing on a secluded island, and Little Richard and Cosmo Dittmar are forced to share a tent for three days as repairs are made to the plane. As a result, Little Richard says he's giving up rock and roll, and he's going to serve God. To this day, whenever Cosmo flies, he brings his own tent. Historical sidebar here, January 28th, 1958, the day after the Lego company patented their famous toy, Bolt Upright, who would become the drummer for the stools, became the first American to choke on a Lego brick, saved by the Heimlich maneuver. True story. At the end of January, Challenge Records released Tequila, and the B-side of that was trained to nowhere by the Champs. The Champs were a lot like the Souls. They had a touring band, and a studio band. The Champs touring band included Glenn Campbell, Jim Seals, and Dash Croft. As a joke, Alvin Anderson would much later uh, talk Jim and Dash into joining the monotheistic cult Baha'i Faith. And the two would have their testicles removed as part of a bizarre Khatib Aqua uh, ritual. And they would later go on to become the band known as Seals and Crofts. Now, the Antonio and Elvin version of the band were on tour in upstate New York, and they got caught in a blizzard like you wouldn't believe. A hundred cars stranded. But that was nothing compared to what happened to Cosmo. So Cosmo is taking his version of the stools on a Middle Eastern tour. Not Middle Eastern United States. We're talking the Middle East. While Cosmo is there, the Iranian government bans rock and roll on the grounds that it's uh, against the concepts of Islam and that it's uh, dangerous uh, to the health. Um, Iranian doctors decide that uh, the gyrations of rock and roll is injurious to the hips. Cosmo and the Faux Stool were taken hostage by Islamic extremists, but were released the next day because there was no media attention. Elvin and Antonio are sick of the snow, so they decide to take the band out to California, and they're gonna play in Oakland, and they hire Paul Robeson to open for them. Not only does he open for them, he kind of acts as their ghetto pass. Hiring Paul Robeson, even for just one gig, caused the stools no end of trouble. 
I mean, the guy was a commie. He had been called before the House Un-American Activities Committee, refused to reveal his ties to the Communist Party, and had his passport revoked. I heard that Al Floss had pulled a few strings to get his passport returned in lieu of paying for the gig. After the Stools Oakland gig, Robeson got his passport back and took off, first for London and then Moscow, where he performed at Lenin Stadium and then went to Yalta, where he hung out with Khrushchev. In March of 58, Link Ray and his Raymen had a hit with Rumble. Early use of power chords, big effect on the stools. Uh, also that March, uh, an Air Force B-47 uh, drops an atomic bomb near Florence, South Carolina. Uh, it doesn't detonate, but the TNT, which is part of the trigger mechanism, uh, blows a hole in the ground and destroys six houses. Al Floss rushes to release the stool single, dropping the bomb the very next day. Go ahead and drop the bomb. It couldn't hurt me anymore. When you left me at the prom And became colder than the world You know, some people see this song as kind of a swipe at Elvis because he was going in the army the day after the song was released on March 24th, 1958. Over the next two years, Elvis's serial number would become the most famous serial number in history. Do I remember Elvis's serial number? 533-11766. Uh, 533-7962 or something like that? Or, no. 533-10761, and I wasn't even born yet. Alan Freed kicked off his Northeast tour with an all-star rock and roll show which featured Jerry Lee Lewis, Buddy Holly and the Crickets, Chuck Berry, Billy and Lily, and Larry Williams. Ticket sales are good, but Freed is feeling insecure about his position as the leader of the teenager's musical taste because Dick Clark's American Bandstand is beginning to gain traction. So he adds the stools to the bill when they hit Boston in May. So it's May 3rd at the Boston Arena. The Stool's first date on the Alan Freed tour. The dancing in the balcony becomes rowdy. It spreads to the aisles. The cops get pushy. And before you know it, a riot breaks out. Uh, then the rest of Saturday's shows are canceled. And on Monday, Freed is charged with anarchy under this old Boston law, claiming he advocated to the crowd to overthrow the United States government. Actually, it was Antonio who was yelling all the anarchy stuff because of all the heat Elvin was getting from the House Un-American Activities Committee. But the cops wanted Alan Freed. Freed made the right payoffs and got the charges dropped. But Boston, New Haven, New Britain, Troy, and Newark all banned live presentations of rock and roll music after that. Now, after the riot, the tour moves on to Hershey, Pennsylvania. And Alan Freed uses this as an opportunity to quit WINS because he doesn't feel that they gave him any support. And he goes right across the street and gets a gig at WABC. Truth be told, he had no interest in working at WABC radio. He wanted to work on the TV station. <laughs> Wins was a bit of a joke radio station. I mean, check this out. Saturday nights at midnight, they'd have the actor Sidney Gross read passages from Edgar Allan Poe to uh, organ music, and they billed it as smoochin' in the car. <laughs> so the Boston riot, you know, and, uh, you had a crowd of like 5,000 kids and only 20 cops to watch over the whole thing. The first half of the show actually was kind of boring, but then after intermission, when the stools came on, things got hopping. You know, things got pretty exciting over there, and there was dancing in the aisles. There was dancing all over the place, and the police stopped the show, and Alan Freed had to come out and make the audience sit down. Once the stools started up again, when they were allowed to, so did the dancing. 
and the cops stopped the show again. But things got really out of control when Chuck Berry was on and some white girl jumped up on the stage and grabbed him by the crotch. And Chuck Berry knew Boston, being the south of the north, he better get it away from the microphone and hide behind the drum kit. If you consider rock and roll's monotonous, tense beat that gives it its jungle-like persistence, what teenager is going to be able to resist dancing to it? At, at least that's what certain people were saying at the time. There were a couple rival gangs at the show that night, the Rockets and the Skippers. I mean, it's Boston, but anyway, one of them threw a chair on the other and it was on. Uh, the fighting spilled out onto St. Botolph Street. There were newspapers reported that there were stabbings and muggings and rapes. I mean, the arena was in a pretty crappy part of town, but it's possible that uh, the cops took every crime that was committed in Boston that night and blamed it on the show. It was right around this time that Massachusetts State Senator Bill Fleming introduced a bill in the State House that would ban rock and roll from all publicly owned buildings. But the measure did not pass. You have to realize what was going on at the time. There was a guy in Tennessee who sued his local radio station because it switched from classical music to rock and roll. And he won. The judge ordered that the classical music had to be put back into the slot that it had been bumped out of by rock. In Atlanta, they issued a police order so that the teenagers could not dance without written consent from their parents. In Minneapolis, there was this Catholic magazine called Contacts, and they went on this campaign to clean up the lyrics in rock and roll. One of their first targets was Elvis Presley's Wear Your Ring Around My Neck because they thought it promoted going steady. And yet, in spite of all that, times were really good. You know, the recording industry's gross dollar volume was just in the neighborhood of $360 million, which is a really nice neighborhood, and a huge rise from just 12 months earlier. In 1958, a total of 72 labels landed on Billboard's Hot 100 for the year. Consider that there was only 47 different labels on the Hot 100 a year earlier, and you can see it was the year of the independence. 76% of the hits were on indies. The other 24% were split between RCA, DECA, Columbia. When it came time to start work on the next album, the uh, Stool's third album, Dropping the Kids Off at the Pool, there was a problem. RCA had started releasing LPs in stereo, and Elvin wanted Dutchko to follow suit, but that was shut down. They did ask him to start making recordings that gave all around sound because Admiral had just come up with a transistor radio that had speakers in the front and back. Elvin just shook his head and retreated back into the studio. At the same time, Antonio and Cosmo reunited and began touring as the Stools. You know, those tours weren't without their hiccups too. For example, Cosmo refused to do any shows on Thursday nights because Circus Boy was on ABC on Thursdays, featuring future monkey star Mickey Dolenz, although Elvin had said publicly that he, he suspected that it was really because the Pat Boone show was on Thursday night as well. Cosmo loved his TV. He was almost inconsolable in February of 1958 when my friend Flicka went off the air. On top of all of the regular touring, you also had to make time to do all of the American Bandstand ripoff shows. Jim Lounsbury's Record Hop in Chicago, The Buddy Dean Show in Baltimore, oh, Ed McKenzie's Saturday Party in Detroit. But then if you did those shows, you ran the risk of getting blackballed by Dick Clark, who by all accounts was a petty dink. In April, the Stools hook up with Irvin Feld's Greatest Show of Stars, which started its 80-day tour of North America in Norfolk, Virginia. Headlining are Sam Cooke, The Silhouettes, Royal Teens, Everly Brothers, Jimmy Reed, and Clyde McFadder. Ticket sales aren't up to Fled's expectations, so the bill is expanded with the addition of Paul Anka, Roy Hamilton, Laverne Baker, Frankie Avalon, and others. The tour grosses over $1 million. 
While Antonio and Cosmo are on the road making money, Alvin is back in the studio recording. June was also a busy month for Al Floss. He takes a huge risk and supports the station staff at WINS in their strike against management, looking for a $3,000 salary increase across the board because the station is making so much more money these days. Al Floss demands WNIS stops playing the Stools albums, which of course makes them play it even more. Two weeks later, when the strike is over, with the jocks getting a $4,000 raise, they repay Floss for his loyalty by playing the Stools records even more. Brilliant, if not risky move. Well, the Stools weren't making uh, any money by any means, um, but they weren't complaining. And I think the reason might have been uh, because uh, there was a lot of fights over money back then. And in July, George Treadwell fired the Drifters and replaced them with another group, the Five Crowns, uh, who became the Ben E. King era Drifters. No complaints from me about the upgrade, but it was a pretty cold-hearted thing to do and just the kind of thing that Al Floss might do. The Stools also managed to pick up a little extra cash in July with Jesse Presley, Elvis's 62-year-old grandfather on his father's side. Jesse Presley had been signed to Legacy Records to record an EP of four Mississippi cotton picking tunes. Legacy made a deal with Dutchco for the Stools to play on some of the tracks. Must have been a pretty good deal because Antonio and Cosmo both came off the road. They recorded Who's That Kicking My Dog Around and Swinging in the Orchard and a couple of others. And by all accounts, Jesse Presley was a mean old cuss who liked to drink. Now, I'm quoting his ex-wife here. He liked to drink, he liked to dress sharp, and he liked to womanize. Jesse Presley was not well regarded by the rest of Elvis's family. And I think it's pretty well known that when Elvis was born, he had a stillborn brother. Um, of course, Elvis's parents and grandmother and grandfather were all there. Jesse Presley showed up drunk and started coochie-cooing the dead baby. Vernon Presley decided to name the dead baby after his father. Jesse Presley's EP would not go on to any significant sales numbers and would be just another fruitless diversion for the Stools as they attempt to record their own third album, Dropping the Kids Off at the Pool, which we will explore next time on the complete and alarming history of America's greatest garage band, The Stools. Join us then, won't you?